Once again, Heavenly Father, we pause at the very outset of our study to thank you for your gracious provision for all that we have need of. We thank you that you are in each believer, along with God the Father and God the Holy, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, and that as the Trinity indwells us, we have all the guarantees which come with us from that indwelling. Glorify God the Son as we talk about these things this morning hour. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. The church, unique, something absolutely different. Never, ever before the day of Pentecost was there a church. The church is called in the Greek the Musterion, M U S. T-E-R-I-O-N. And all that has been done has been to transliterate it and call it mystery. But it isn't a mystery. Musterion means sacred secret. It was something that was known to the members of the fraternity and only to the members of the initiates of the fraternity. And God tells us in Ephesians chapter 3 that the things about the church age were kept a secret from the Old Testament prophets, writers. There is no church anywhere in the Old Testament revealed that it began at Pentecost and runs until the rapture of the church. This is why this is unique, a unique period of time. You see, all of the Scripture fits together beautifully. And you will see a a mid- or post-tribulation rapture it does despot to the whole content of the doctrine of the uniqueness of the church age. There can be no compromise on this because of the facts of the uniqueness of this age. Uh, the uniqueness of the church age is, it, is that it is an intercalation. And we'll deal with that word later on as one of the, uh, uh, the definitions, but uh, something which was placed into something which uh, has was not before and is not after began the day of pentecost will go to the day of the rapture of the church and there are 10 unique things 10 things 10 characteristics of this period of time that were never true in the old testament never true of any other age of believers and will never be true again of any age of believers in the future a most unique thing and the first thing we saw was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not an ecstatic. It is not speaking in tongues, contrary to what some will tell you. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is the unique work of God the Holy Spirit at the point of salvation when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior, in which God the Holy Spirit takes the believing sinner and places him into union with the Lord Jesus Christ. This is unique. It has never taken place. There was no Old Testament saint who was ever in union with Jesus Christ. There has never been a believer who was placed in union with Christ before the day of Pentecost, and there will not be after the rapture. So it's very unique. And this becomes the basis for the formation of the church which is called also the body of Christ, which is also called the royal family of God. Now, the, the Old Testament believers were members of the family, but we're royal family. We are royalty, something which is very, very unique. And so the, uh, the, 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 forma the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit leads to the formation of a unique organism. Not an organization, but an organism entirely different from anything else. Nowhere near Israel, nothing like anything in the world that the world knows anything about. The third thing, uh, uniqueness of the church age, is that it is the unique age in which uh, it the, the is given to us the unique protocol plan of God. Now God, of course, has a plan for each age that's why we def this is 
definitely a, uh, we call it the protocol plan of God. Simply to define it, see, the, the Jews had the ritual plan of God. And the ritual plan of God was the way that they were to function under a specific ritual defined in the Old Testament Mosaic Law. Now that passed away when the veil of the temple was rent from top to bottom at the cross. And we now have a protocol plan of God. It's unique. And we've defined protocol as a rigid, long-established code and procedure for the royal family of God, prescribing complete deference to superior rank and authority, followed by strict adherence to due order and procedure, coupled with precisely correct procedure. We're not accustomed to it because we don't, don't live with royalty uh, in the United States of America. When George Washington said he would not uh, become king uh, and refused the royalty that was uh, offered to him, uh, he laid the precedent for the fact there's no royalty in the United States of America. And so we don't understand the matter of protocol. How do you... How does royalty act? Uh, what is expected of royalty? Apparently, if some of the tabloids are true, neither does Princess Di know what's expected of royalty. And uh, uh, when you are a part of royalty, you, don't, you aren't like ordinary people. You're different from ordinary people. And just because she wasn't reared as royalty, and that's one reason why it was the custom in the past, for the royal families to marry uh, with other royal families in Europe because the, if uh, the, uh, the daughter of the uh, king of Sweden would marry the, the son of the king of, of England, she grew up under the principle of pro protocol. She knew what was expected of royalty and she would therefore fit into the English royalty and vice versa. And so it was a uh, common uh, for the royalty to marry royalty. And when uh, Prince Charles reached outside of royalty and married uh, the quote-unquote commoner, uh, she, she doesn't understand the principles of, uh, of uh, the protocol of royalty, which is not to excuse some of the idiotic things that he does, but uh, as they've often said, kings get away with murder because uh, they are royalty. Uh, but, and we don't, we don't look at upon royalty as something to, to be admired or to be uh, coveted. Uh, we're certainly glad we don't have it here in the United States. However, we have become royal family, and therefore we are uh, spiritual royalty. And with spiritual royalty comes a rigid, long-established code that God has laid down for us. And this prescribes uh, deference to superior rank, that is, to God. Uh, as the as the final authority and God's subordained uh, chain of command, uh, you and I don't understand uh, the uh, dukes and earls and uh, other things like that. We don't understand the the order of royalty. Uh, we don't understand uh, who what it is to be a lord uh, somebody. Uh, because we're not familiar with that. But there is a specific chain of command under royalty. And the royalty has learned to respect the chain of command. Furthermore, uh, there is uh, a precedence. Uh, and uh, uh, we follow a precedence. The precedence was set by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ during His incarnation. And there is a precisely correct procedure, which is to say that during our time on the earth, the royal family of God has a code. It is prescribed in the mystery doctrines of the New Testament, the epistles. In these epistles is given us a code of conduct which is called superhuman. Nobody in, the, in his uh, uh, human ability could ever live according to the superhuman requirements that are given to us in this code that God lays down for us. But he also provides a supernatural power for us to be able to function, and that uh, will come uh, along uh, in these provisions. But with this code is a precisely uh, prescribed uh, method of, of uh, uh, living, a procedure for living. And uh, every man doesn't do what's right in his own eyes. God tells us how to live, 
and that is uh, uh, to follow this code that he has laid down for us. And while it is not according to the Mosaic law, we don't live according to the Mosaic law, that has been abrogated at the cross. We live according to a new set of laws, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, says Romans chapter 8. And so it comes, uh, it becomes necessary for the believer to understand that under this unique code, God has set forth the principle that human power will never be used to execute his plan. That human ability, human talent, human intelligence, human perspicacity, all of these things are abrogated and, and laid aside in deference to the divine power called omnipotence that God makes available to those of us who are members of his royal family. Therefore, the protocol plan of God is based on a unique power structure which has no precedence in the Old Testament. David, other great men of the past, uh, lived, but they did not live by means of the power of the Holy Spirit. They did not have the Holy Spirit uh, as the power source of their lives. Now, from the day of Pentecost on, every believer has been indwelt by the Holy Spirit for power. But also we have been indwelt by God the Father and God the Son, which we shall notice also uh, later on. And therefore, this is a unique period of time uh, called the protocol plan of God, in which God provides a unique plan, but he also provides a unique power for us to live according to that. For the church age is the only dispensation in which every believer has received a portfolio of invisible assets. Now, I recognize sometimes we have to do a little more defining because of the fact that uh, the vocabulary that I have chosen to use is designed to communicate, but sometimes it obscures because of the, the language. But let me, uh, let, me, let me explain it in short points. First of all, God is perfect. And only, a perfect God can only come up with a perfect plan. Now, believers, the finest believer in all the world, no matter what he tries to do, is imperfect because he's born that way and he has an old sin nature and will never overcome that. An imperfect person is incapable of executing a perfect plan. Therefore, the perfect God has had to come up with a grace provision. Now, grace means that this provision is going to be unmerited, unearned, undeserved in any way. God is going to give a, make a grace provision so that he can take an imperfect person and allow that imperfect person to execute a perfect plan. But remember, grace means that this person, this imperfect person, will never earn it or never deserve it. He doesn't get it by going to church. He doesn't get it by being good. He doesn't get it by being baptized. He doesn't get it by trying the hardest. He doesn't get it by doing the best he can and leaving the rest to God. It is totally up to God, and that's what grace is all about, you see. Therefore, it is necessary for God to provide imperfect believer with uh, what is called assets. These assets uh, are the, the, the positive things which God provides for us so that we can execute the perfect plan of God. So that we can uh, execute this code, this magnificent code which he has given to us. And the great problem with the church today, beloved, is that the church has been trying for years to live the Christian way of life from the source of their own power, their own ability. And down through the years, what's, what has happened is Christians have tried it. It hasn't worked, and therefore they have given up on that. But they, they still go through the motions, and they play church. They play at church. They pretend to be what they're not. And inside there is a dissatisfaction, an unhappiness, 
a restlessness and a, and a frustration that they would never admit to anybody on the earth because of the fact that it would be embarrassing to them. But it is true that the average Christian has long since given up on trying to live the Christian way of life. And so they go to church every week and get a challenge. And they're challenged and they go home and they try to do what the challenge says. But you see, the challenge that we get is never to be what we can't be, to do what we can't do, to accomplish what we can't accomplish. And yet that's what the pastors in the average church are doing. You go and get a challenge. We must be witnesses. Listen, you never need to be told to be a witness if you're controlled by the Holy Spirit functioning under divine assets. You will be a witness. You never have to be told how to go about witnessing. Here are three ways to do it. Here is the Roman road. Here is the Campus Crusade uh, uh, book. Here is this method. Here's that method. And uh, we'll go through a long method on evangelism exposed. This is how we do it. You don't need a method. The, only, the, Holy, the Holy Spirit is the author of ingenuity. He doesn't need to give you some kind of a four-point plan, but you will be a witness when you're controlled by the Holy Spirit. It is the automatic, natural, normal result. The same thing is true with all the other things that are related to the Christian way of life. It isn't something that you do. It's something that God does in you. And He gives everything that's necessary for this to be so that you can really relax. It's the most relaxed, wonderful life that a person could live. It's free from the pressures of uh, uh, the peer group. It's free from the pressures from uh, unbelievers and believers alike. And the, the pressure doesn't come even from God because God uh, offers it to you. And if you don't want it, He doesn't force it on you. And you can go through all of your life miserable, unfulfilled, unhappy, and seeking it like a, the, the uh, bee going from flower to flower, finding happiness, never to realize that part of his provision for you is that he wants to share his eternal happiness with you. And so, we, well, we take the, the example of marriage. We're working on putting the book into popular form. Uh, people uh, uh, go to marriage ceremony, uh, uh, service after marriage service, uh, uh, seminar after seminar, counselor after counselor, for the purpose of trying to get marriage squared away. All they need to do is to allow God, the Holy Spirit, to produce in them what is necessary to be produced. And then there, th th it will work. It will work. Because God guarantees that His plan will work, you see. But, uh, and, and everything is related to it. But these assets, these assets are not seen. Everybody wants visible assets. We talk in terms of like money is a, is a visible asset. Talent is a visible asset. Uh, uh, intelligence uh, as it is expressed, is a, is a physical asset, a visible asset. These are not what he's talking about. He's talking about invisible assets, things which cannot be seen that he has provided. Well, uh, therefore, point B deals with what are these invisible assets. There are three categories of invisible assets that God has provided for every believer. Well, two, two actually, and uh, under, there are some underneath uh, no, there are three. That's right. I, I, I failed to to remember. The first, the first of the three categories is primary assets. Then there are secondary assets, and I'll give you what they are in a moment. And then there would be personnel assets. All right. First of all in the primary assets and we discern these uh, from many passages though the categories are uh, the major principle is outlined in Ephesians 1 3 to 6 we have first of all received under primary asset escrow blessing that is God in eternity past has determined he, he knows you before you were born he knew everything about you and he knew what it was that would make you happy. He knew what it was that would fulfill you. He knew what it was that would make you the most effective person. And therefore he designed certain escrow blessing for you in eternity past, and he placed it in the escrow account. Now, there's no way we can describe what an escrow account is unless you have some familiar with uh, perhaps uh, uh, buying and selling a home. Uh, if you are 
uh, going to buy a home, uh, you uh, uh, make a promise uh, to buy this place, and you give them X amount of money, uh, and this money is placed into escrow. It is held there. And escrow simply means a place for holding. Uh, this is uh, uh, being held until certain uh, requirements are fulfilled. Uh, once the, let's say, uh, uh, the, uh, the survey has been finished and the, uh, the uh, uh, title search has been accomplished and your credit has been established and uh, the money has been determined that it's there uh, for the balance, then the escrow account can be released. Many times uh, you have a minor child who uh, uh, inherits a million dollars but it's held in escrow until according to the will uh, which says when this child reaches 25 the money which is held in escrow shall now be released to that child and so it's simply a place where these are hold, uh, held so uh, escrow blessing simply means blessings which are on hold for every believer designed by God in eternity past for your eternal blessing and happiness blessing means happiness Blessing uh, refers to internal and external happiness. It always appears in the in the uh, the plural, by the way, uh, in the Greek and in the Hebrew. Uh, but it's uh, uh, it's internal and an external blessing. But it's special blessing, which has been designed with your personal uh, your personality and everything in 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 uh, in, a, in in account. Everything has been taken into account. The way God made you. And this will include everything from the perfect uh, person, your perfect mate, your perfect man, perfect woman, to the job that God has for you, to the geographical location He wants you to be. But you see, He can't release these things to you as a babe. You don't understand them. You, you don't appreciate them. You don't know how to handle them. You cannot uh, give a person without capacity uh, certain things. They have to have capacity. Once they have capacity, they know how to handle those things. And so escrow blessing means that until you reach the place where you have capacity to receive these things, these happinesses which God has on hold for you, God takes holds them. They are in hold, but they are designed for you. And if you don't take them, if you don't reach the place of spiritual growth to get them, they won't be given to anybody else, but you'll never get them. And I would guess that 99% of all believers never get the escrow blessing that God has for them. It may be a financial blessing. Uh, it may be a promotion in a, in a job. It may be leadership uh, blessing. It, it could be all kinds of things that God has designed for different believers at different times. Uh, David, remember, was a shepherd boy. But his escrow account said that when you reach a certain period, you're going to be king. There's no way, because the, king, the kingship was uh, in the line of Benjamin at that time. And Saul had a, a fine son, uh, Jonathan, who was already the heir apparent to the throne. And uh, he was the same age as David. There's no way that David could ever become king. David was from an entirely different tribe. He was from the tribe of Judah. Well, it's not going to succeed from one tribe to another. Ah, you see, but those things are not important with God. All God says is, for David, you grow in grace. And David grew in grace. He started when he was just a shepherd boy uh, and, uh, out there uh, watching the sheep. He didn't waste his time. He didn't horse around throwing rocks uh, at cans. Uh, not that they had cans. But he used that time uh, very worthwhile. And he uh, finally came to the place where uh, he, re he passed the, 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 the shepherd test. And then uh, he passed the, uh, the humility test uh, when his uh, uh, brothers uh, were all uh, chosen before him to be the king. And he didn't resent that fact. And finally, when Samuel said, Thou art the one, uh, and he was anointed king, he didn't go around and boast and, uh, and make himself a, a big shot. He just remained until God was ready to promote him. Because he knew that if God doesn't promote you, you're not promoted. And eventually he was tested uh, under the Goliath test, and he passed. He was uh, 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 tested under the arrogance test, and he passed. He went out to battle as a young uh, uh, military leader, and when he came back, 
the women came out, as they often do, looking for their hero, and they made up a song. And the chorus got together and they sang, Saul has slain his thousands, but David his ten thousands. And David didn't go around with a big head and say, yeah, look at me, I, I killed more than, the, than uh, Saul. Now that didn't affect him at all. Because he had a soul that was spiritually grown. Saul, on the other hand, became extremely jealous when he heard this thing. And from that time on, he sought to kill David. Because he had nothing in his soul. Zero, zero, point zero, zero. But David passed test after test. David passed the outlaw test. He was hunted down. He, who was the anointed king of Israel, was hunted by the rejected king. The rejected king was going to kill the king uh, heir apparent that God had appointed personally and anointed with oil. And uh, yet uh, he didn't uh, force himself when he had two opportunities to kill Saul. He didn't do it. He said, I will not touch the, touch the head of God's anointed. In God's time, in God's place, I will be promoted. He will be demoted. And we passed the test for all down through the years until finally, after the death of Saul, David, uh, uh, now, uh, who is now 40 years of age, he's been waiting 20 years, is now promoted to become the king of Israel. He had leadership escrow blessing. It took all that time for him to reach the place where God could pour it out. And now God's pouring. And when David says in the 23rd Psalm, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. That is a horrible translation. That doesn't say that at all. The Hebrew says, Surely grace and goodness will pursue me all the days of my life. And that's a whole lot different than grace and mercy following me. I'm here to tell you that. Grace and goodness is pursuing every believer. In Psalm, uh, Isaiah 40, God tells us that God is tapping his foot, waiting to pour out that escrow blessing on believers who will advance spiritually. But that's one of the three categories, uh, one of the two categories of primary blessing. The second has to do with a special uh, blessing associated with election. These are, these are spiritual blessing, election and predestination. Aha. Oh, people get all mixed up in these. God didn't elect some people to be saved and some people to be lost. He didn't elect some, predestined some to be saved and some to be lost. He predestined some believers to be conformed to the image of God the Son. And uh, this is uh, what our election and predestination has to do. And there are certain blessings which are related to our spiritual adulthood. Spiritual adulthood, which is uh, what our election is related to. God says that when you reach that age, that spiritual age, when you grow up, you will have certain things that are provided for you. In the meantime, there are all kinds of things. Now, secondary blessings. These include uh, assets related to positive volition. There are going to be certain blessings which are going to give, be given to you along the way. Uh, for every positive volitional decision you make, every decision you make for Jesus Christ, every decision you make for doctrine, every time you choose uh, doctrine over uh, some other priority of your life, which is clamoring for precedence, every time you make that decision, God has blessing which He's ready to pour out for you. Secondly, there is a, a blessing related to the production of divine good. For every time you are controlled by the Holy Spirit, everything that you do is divine good. It is the production of the Holy Spirit, not the production of yourself. And God always blesses divine good. Uh, he always pro uh, blesses what He produces. And therefore, if He uses you in any way to produce divine good, He suits a specific blessing, a portion of happiness to you in that situation. Thirdly, there is a unique area of blessing which is related to undeserved suffering. Now, deserved suffering is when you're, uh, when you're spanked for being out of fellowship, for negative volition, for sins, for all kinds of uh, uh, aberrations. But when it's undeserved suffering, it is suffering which you have not deserved uh, in discipline or self-induced misery. When you, are, when you go through undeserved suffering, God has certain blessings for you that He could not give you in any other circumstance or situation. It's the kind of a thing in which okay, you'll never get in heaven in the future because there's no suffering in the future. Therefore, it's, it, it's related to time. But it's, it's blessing in undeserved suffering. And then there's also blessing which is related to your invisible impact. See, as a believer, you have impact in four basic areas. 
as you as an invisible hero first of all you have personal impact you will have an impact on your family we uh, picked up a very interesting movie over the weekend uh, called pistol the story of pistol pete Mer one year in the life of pistol pete maravich pistol pete took uh, uh, was the youngest basketball professional basketball player ever inducted into the Basketball Hall of Fame. An outstanding young uh, basketball. He only lived to be 41 or 2. He died playing uh, scrimmage basketball after he retired with Dr. J James Dobson uh, uh, there in California. But uh, the amer amazing thing was the relation, this, and this, this, this story was about, the story was about the impact of a father on a son. The tremendous impact that this father had on his son. And there are a lot of fathers who'd love to have an impact on their sons, but they don't know how to do it. Well, if you are a growing believer in, uh, as a father, you will have a fantastic impact as a father or a mother, a parent. You will have a fantastic impact uh, in uh, other relationships uh, of family. You will have a tremendous uh, impact uh, on your job. You will have a great impact on the clubs uh, or the teams that you belong to. Uh, in every circumstance, whatever it is, you will have an, uh, an impact. It's not something that can be seen. It's not going to be the number of souls you've won that can be counted by the notches on your Bible. That's not what he's talking about. It's an invisible impact. But secondly, you'll have a national impact, an Im impact on your nation. You become a part of the pivot. And since you're part of the pivot, you are part of the preservative of the nation, the, pres the part of the salt of the land that preserves this nation. Thirdly, you will have an international impact. That is, it will reach not only to the United States, but it will reach around the world. For God has sent all of us into all the world to proclaim the gospel. You'll have an international impact. But you'll also have, in the fourth situation, you will have a, an angelic impact, and that is upon the fallen angels, there will be a testimony that uh, you will have an impact upon them uh, as far as secondary assets are concerned. Uh, your, go your life has, therefore, meaning, purpose, and definition. You're not just going through some stupid motions of getting up in the morning, taking a shower, uh, eating breakfast, going to work, come home, eat supper, watch television, go to bed, and the same cycle, day after day after day, meaning nothing, need, having nothing. And if we live for weekends, so you can go out and, and to tie one on or, or to play golf or uh, pursue a hobby or, or do something uh, that's different and then to start the whole routine over. And it's just nothing but day in and day out, routine life with no uh, meaning, no purpose, no definition. What a meaningless life that is. What a waste of, of valuable time uh, that God only gives us, uh, well, what does he say, three score and ten, uh, uh, four score and ten, whatever it is. Uh, we have just a short period of time. And it's terrible to just waste time in accomplishing nothing. But with impact, you have the fantastic happiness that comes from having an impact upon the society in which you live. And you may not even realize uh, the impact that you have as the legend goes it's not a biblical legend about the great prophet who wherever his shadow fell uh, he did, uh, he it was always behind him so he never saw it uh, wherever his shadow fell there was a, a blessing that took place wherever your shadow falls that will take place the third uh, area is personnel impact uh, and or assets and personnel uh, assets have to do with the spiritual gift that God has given to you uh, in order to or gifts in order to function according to his plan. There is great uh, satisfaction and uh, fulfillment in realizing God has given you a, sp a specific spiritual gift and that you are functioning according to that spiritual gift uh, here on the earth and you leave the results with God. So uh, this is a unique period. Uh, never before uh, has all of these things been true, though I use David as an illustration, it's simply because it's, an, it's easy to use. We have, it, it, ours is, is an invisible situation and circumstance. The fifth uniqueness of the church age is that there are two royal commissions for every believer. Now, a commission 
comes from the word commit, that which is, and commitment has to do with being given. Something, there are two areas where God has committed or given to believers, areas of fantastic responsibility. Two royal commissions. First of all, you are commissioned, all of us are, commissioned as a royal priest. Now, as a royal priest, you have the privilege of representing yourself to God. You do not need an intermediary. There is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. Therefore, you have the privilege of representing yourself to God. In other dispensations, there, was, uh, there were specialized priesthoods. For example, the patriarchal priesthood under Abraham. The, uh, the uh, Levitical priesthood under uh, uh, the, the Mosaic law. But during this period of time, you have the privilege of representing yourself to God. Your, your royal priesthood is the basis for your privacy. You have a, law, a right to live your life as under the Lord without interference from any other person. There are all kinds of legalistic believers, fatheads in their arrogance, who think that they have a right to tell other people how to live their lives, and they don't. As your pastor teacher, I don't have a right to tell any of you how to live your life. That's between you and God. And if God is not satisfied with it, then He has to deal with you personally. I am here to teach you what the Word of God says and leave the rest with Him. You have that privacy, the privacy of your own priesthood, the privacy to live your life as under the Lord. And if you want to be out of fellowship and just take divine discipline, that's entirely up to you. But this also means you have a prayer life, a prayer related to the, your, your, your cognition of doctrine. You pray according to knowledge, the knowledge of doctrine. And of course, the less you know, the less you're able to pray intelligently. The more you know, the greater you will be your, your fantastic prayer life in which you stop going to God uh, with every little thing, give me this, give me that, give me, give me, give me, give me, but you go to God for fellowship, to enjoy His company. And uh, it isn't because you, you want something all the time. Only babies come to their father with I want all the time. Now, some of them do grow up to be adults as far as age is concerned, and they still go back to Daddy, give me this, give me that. But when you find that you have reached maturity, the greatest thing about a parent and a child is not that the, parent, the child comes to the parent only when it wants something. It's when the child comes to enjoy the fellowship of the, of the parent and have a good time just enjoying the parent's company. And the, comp the, the, the parent can enjoy the company of the child as, a, as an adult, as, a, as an equal, and have a fantastic relationship. Instead of always having that, uh, that to give me this, they, uh, what does he, uh, when you hear the phone, hi, this is your son. You say, what does he want now? This is your, what does she want now? You know it's going to be that. There's no fellowship there. It's no relationship at all. It's just a handout thing. Well, prayer to God is the same way. Uh, here I come again. Well, what do you want now? No, God, I just want to tell you I love you. Just what, wonderful uh, to just chat with you here. But you see, it's a fantastic privilege. Uh, and when you represent yourself before God. But you're not only a priest, beloved, you're a royal priest, uh, uh, being, uh, meaning by that, that you share the royalty which belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. The second of our royal commissions is that we are royal ambassadors. For our patriotic portion, I'm going to read you uh, an, an excerpt from Reader's Digest in which it talks about one, uh, one of the great ambassadors of the United States of America uh, in, uh, in our recent history, uh, who was a, an ambassador to the nation of Kenya, Africa. And you'll, you, you'll you, keep in mind, as I read it at the beginning of the second class, that uh, something about this, the, the principle that as an ambassador, uh, first of all, you don't appoint yourself. You are appointed by a higher power. And, and, and whether it's a, a political ambassador appointed by the government or royal ambassador appointed, appointed by God, this means that uh, you, you are appointed by God the Father uh, as a part of your riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Secondly, you don't support yourself. No ambassador supports himself. 
He's supported by the one who sends him. This is the reason that even losers receive logistical grace from God. The thirdly, the ambassador has his policy and instructions in written form, and we have ours in the written form called the Word of God. Fourthly, the ambassador does not belong to the country to which he goes. Uh, he is actually uh, taking, uh, representing a, a different country to the country to which he goes. And we are citizens of heaven, and we are here representing the Lord Jesus Christ here on the earth. Uh, uh, fifthly, an ambassador does not live in a foreign country for his own uh, pro personal interest, for his own profit. He is living in this foreign nation for the interest of and on behalf of the one who has sent him. And therefore, the believer is more concerned with the interests of the Lord than his own interests. And when doctrine invades your soul by becoming your number one priority, you change your attitude about what's really important in life, and you have the right set of priorities. Uh, sixthly, uh, an ambassador does not treat any insult as personal. He recognizes that the insult is to his government, and therefore he doesn't take these things personally. This is analogous to the believer in the Lord Jesus Christ with uh, uh, impersonal love, uh, unconditional love for the world uh, to whom he has been sent. Uh, the, uh, then, uh, 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 seventhly, the, uh, an ambassador, uh, when it, he is recalled, uh, it is tantamount to uh, the declaration of war uh, on the part of the country which has sent him when it's, he's recalled. And when the church is removed from this uh, life in the rapture, it's a tantamount to the declaration of war from God upon uh, the, uh, the, uh, the earth and uh, those who are in control. The greatest warfare in human history will begin after the church has been raptured. So we have these two royal commissions, unique. There were, we didn't, there were no royal priests. There were all kinds of priests, no royal priests. There are, and there, no, none has been an ambassador. Uh, see, nowhere, no time before Israel was placed in the land. People were to come to the land, and there they were to hear the gospel and go back. We are told to go. We go representing him. And where are we to go? Into all the world. And what are we to do? We're to preach the gospel to every creature. We are to disciple. Uh, having gone, we are to disciple all nations. We are to baptize them. That's to evangelize them. We are to make disciples, that is, students of the Word of God, of all nations. And our responsibility does not end uh, with uh, one area. It, it, it reaches to the, the whole world. Sixthly, the church age is unique because each believer is indwelt by each member of the Trinity. Now, this is, to me, amazing. I really... that as you sit here at this period of time and you don't look like it, and I'm sure I don't look like it, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, all three indwell your physical body and mine as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. God the Father indwells the believer according to John 14, 23, Ephesians 4, 6, 2 John 9, and Philippians 2, 13. Now, He indwells us as the author of our portfolio of invisible assets. He is the grantor of our escrow blessing. He indwells us as the mastermind of of the protocol plan. See, all these we have dealt with, so we know where we are. He is also the, indwells us as the designer of our own palace. And that is the sphere of divine power called the, the divine dynasphere. And this is a guarantee 
of his ministry throughout the entire church age. He will never, ever stop indwelling you. You aren't going to chase him away. All the sin that you commit does not affect his indwelling. He is still there. And it guarantees that you will always have the invisible assets, the escrow account, you will have the pl uh, fantastic plan, and you will have a divine dinosphere. It will be there. And he dwells within you to guarantee that those things are yours. Now, there may be, uh, uh, most of your life, you don't sense the, fill the, the indwelling of God the Father. In fact, there's no way that you can know that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit actually indwell you by some kind of feeling. Now, there are people who want that. They're looking for some... How do I know that God indwells me? The answer is, the Bible says so. And you believe the Bible. That's why I can't stand that song. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. You ask me how I know he lives? He lives within my heart. Let me tell you something. Buddha lives in the hearts of Buddhists. Muhammad lives in the hearts of Muslims. Because he lives in somebody's heart is no proof of anything. How do I know he lives within my body? The Bible says so. And that's how you know, not because you have some kind of a rosy glow, or you have some kind of a feeling, or he lives within my heart. A lot of garbage and fall are all and fuzzy, stupid thinking on the part of ignorant believers. Now, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. How do you know you're saved? Well, I remember the day when I was saved, I went forward, and from that time on, the lights were... Let me tell you something, that has nothing to do with it. You believed on the Lord Jesus Christ in a moment of time, and in that point of time, God did 40 things for you in one shot. In one split second, in the twinkling of an eye, 40 things were yours, and you didn't feel one of those things. You didn't feel... Now, there are people who look for it. They want... Now, the Holy Spirit came to dwell within your body. God the Father came to dwell in your body. God the Son came to dwell in your body. And you didn't feel, you know, that, that warmth. That I can, I, this year I can hear some idiot giving a testimony. I felt a warmth that started at the top of my head and spread right down through my whole body till it came to the bottom of my, my toes, and I was just tingling. And that's how they know. And so all kinds of other idiotic believers are waiting for that tingling experience. That tingling experience. And they pray, oh God, give me that experience. I'm gonna... yeah, but how do you know? Listen, the Lord said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Did you believe? Yes, you're saved. How do you know? The Bible says so. Not because you feel any different. Not because you look any different. Not because of the way you see things, not because all things are made new, that's not true. Second Corinthians 5.17 refers to our new position, not to a new experience. How do you know God the Father indwells you? Because it says so in these passages. That's how you know. And you take that, you believe it by faith. We, we go by, by means of faith, not by means of sight. Now, am I going to watch you and see if I can see God the Father dwelling within you? I better not, because most believers, you can't tell. But, it's, but it is true. The second person of the Godhead, God the Son, also indwells the believer. This is given to us in John 14:20, uh, John 17, 22 and 23, and 26. It is given to us in Romans 8, 10, in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, in Galatians 2.20, in Colossians 1.27, and 1 John 2.24. Now, the indwelling of God the Son is both a sign and a badge of our royalty. Since He is the Son, God the Son, and we are placed in Him, and we have already studied 
how that what we share that belongs to him, we share his eternal life, we share his righteousness, we share his election, we share his sonship, we share his destiny, we share his sanctification, we share his priesthood, we share his kingship. He is the sign that we are uh, a part of the royal family of God. We are here to complement our Lord's, with an E, we are here to complement our Lord's strategic victory on the cross. We are here to extend his victory of the hypostatic union when he lived on the earth uh, into uh, this new age called the church age. And we are to exploit his victory on the cross with tactical victory, which means in individual battles. He won the great overall battle. It's our job now to finish up the little battles. And he gives us this ability to do so. And he indwells us to guarantee that we can do so. He is the guarantee of our escrow blessing. See, God the Father uh, ha is the grantor. He is called the grantee. That is, he grants it to us. When we reach the place of capacity, God the Son sees to it that we get the blessing that we need, that, we are, that is, he, is, he has for us. All of our escrow blessings were placed in Christ, and he distributes them to us in grace when we have the capacity to receive them. In addition to that, he is our confidence of eternal glory, Colossians 1.27. This motivates us to continue our spiritual growth in the protocol plan of God because we want to be pleasing to him. It also rela it is related to our being occupied with who and what he is. And uh, it is the basis for our assigning the number one priority to God uh, a relationship over people relationship. We would rather be acceptable to God than to be necessarily be acceptable to people. The indwelling Christ is the guarantee also of 100% availability of divine power in our lives in order for us to function because it was to him, it is also to us. And of course, the fact that he was resurrected from the dead, his indwelling guarantees the, our eternal life after death. Well, we'll take up the third person and c c conclude uh, the rest of the, uh, uh, the other ten uh, characteristics of the uniqueness of the church age after uh, we uh, pause in for our uh, fellowship and uh, communion and a song or two, and then we'll continue this. It's beloved, uh, I'm a, uh, the average believer is ignorant of maybe everything but one or two of these things. And yet they're so important. It seems like it's, it's very uh, academic. But I'm going to, here to tell you something. If you understand the uniqueness of this church age and what God has provided for you, you stop living that crummy life of crawling around on the ground underneath the table and eating the crumbs that fall down. When God says, sit down at the table, eat the feast. What are you fooling around with the crumbs when I've got a feast here on the table for you? You begin to realize what you're yours, and then you know what you do? You possess your possessions, as, as Louis Bray Chaffer says. Possess your possessions. They're yours. Why don't you take them? Don't leave them. Take them. How do you take them? There's God's way of taking them. It's grace through faith and spiritual advance, spiritual growth. That's how you do it. But all that's yours, things that David would have looked at and said, Oh, I'd love to have those things. Isaiah said, I wish I could have those things. But the yours, for by grace and grace alone. Now, thank you, Father, for that which you've provided. May God, the Holy Spirit, help us to appreciate these things. I ask in Jesus' name, amen.